All right, well, we've reached 12 o'clock noon, so we will go ahead and get started here uh, while we continue to have people sign in. But let me welcome you to uh, this first panel of the Georgia Legislative Policy Forum. My name is Kyle Wingfield. I'm the president and CEO of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, and we're very pleased that each of you have joined us today. Um, <clears throat> since 2010, uh, the Georgia Public Policy Foundation has staged this event uh, typically in the fall as, as kind of a kickoff to the upcoming legislative session to preview some of the issues that are most important facing Georgia and Georgians uh, that our lawmakers will be tasked with dealing with. And we're very excited this year to be presenting for the first time in a hybrid format. Uh, typically, this has been only an in-person event. Uh, last year, due to the pandemic, we were only virtual. And this year, we're going to be doing a bit of both. So uh, we hope each of you have also registered for Friday's in-person portion of this event, uh, where we'll be talking about education reform, energy, and we'll hear a great keynote speech over lunch from Dr. Charles Bullock of the University of Georgia. So if you haven't already purchased your ticket for that, we would encourage you to do so. Um, <clears throat> this portion, of course, was, was no charge. Uh, there will be a charge for that, and you can find more details for that at georgiapolicy.org. Um, I do want to thank our sponsors for this event. I can get it to actually go here. Here we go. Uh, we have platinum sponsors Verizon, the Walton Family Foundation, and Georgia Power. And we have silver sponsors Ed Choice and Georgia EMC, Oglethorpe Power, and Georgia Transmission. Uh, we, we thank them very much for, um, for their sponsorship, without which this event would not be possible. Uh, and they, many of them are longtime supporters of this event and, um, and all, the, all the interesting information that's brought to Georgians over the years. Um, this first panel will, of course, focus on tax reform. Uh, that's been a long time priority of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. The legislature over the years has done some very good things on that, and we believe that there's an opportunity to do more um, in, the, in the coming year. So we're excited to hear uh, about those possibilities from our panel. And with that, uh, well, well, before I turn it over to Chris, let me mention one more time, as I'm sure he will do, if you have questions for the panel, please go ahead and put those in the chat or the Q&A. And as, as we get toward the end of the presentations, uh, we'll be able to uh, pass those along to our panelists and get some good questions asked and answered. So now with that said, I will pass it off to our moderator for this panel, uh, Chris Denson, who is the Director of Policy and Research here at the Foundation. Chris, take it away. All right, thank you for that, Kyle. And uh, today's uh, official title for our, our panel on taxes is Neighbors Envy, Owners Pride. Uh, the thought process being behind this so often in the media under the Gold Dome, we, you know, we hear how Tennessee, how Florida have no income tax compared or no personal income tax compared to Georgia. And you know, we're hearing about these tax reforms that North Carolina has put in place. And we just really wanted to lay out that competitive landscape for what it looks like in Georgia compared to our neighboring states and then potential ways that we could go about, um, you know, addressing and making Georgia, you know, more competitive from a tax standpoint. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our, our panelists that are joining us today. Uh, first, we have um, two of our, our state legislators that are here with us. Uh, uh, Senator Chuck Hustetler, uh, Representative Shaw Blackman. We'd like to thank both of them for uh, taking time out, uh, as, as many of you are aware, I'm sure, we are currently in the midst of our redistricting session uh, that occurs every 10 years. And so I'd like to thank both of them for joining us today. Um, Senator Huffstetler is the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, which has jurisdiction over the tax code in the state of Georgia. 
And his counterpart in the House, Chairman Shaw Blackman, is chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. And so we're going to, you know, we look forward to their remarks here. But um, our, our first two panelists will really help us out and lay a little bit of background for, for what where Georgia is at and what Georgia can do. Uh, our first presenter, presenter is Catherine Lawhead, the senior policy analyst with the uh, Center for State Tax Policy at the Tax Foundation. Uh, and then she'll be followed by um, William Burke, who's the director of research for the Beacon Hill Institute. Uh, the Georgia Public Policy Foundation has recently partnered with the Beacon Hill Institute to produce a series of, of models for what um, lowering and flattening the state tax rate would look like. Uh, we should be releasing that here shortly. Everyone that's on the, on the call today will be receiving um, that report directly, along with a series of additional materials around that. And so um, we look forward to hearing what both of them have to say. And um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine to uh, let us let everyone know where, where Georgia stands in, in relation to our uh, neighboring states and nationally. Well, thanks, Chris and Kyle. It's great to be, be with you all today to talk about this important topic. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you see that OK? Excellent. Well, great. Um, so if you're not familiar, familiar with the Tax Foundation, we are a nonprofit and nonpartisan tax policy research organization. And we've been working for over 83 years to advance sound tax policy at the state, federal, and most recently international levels. And so one of our focuses as an organization is really conversations like this, where our goal is to help policymakers at all levels of government look for ways to make their tax codes better structured. So no matter how much revenue a state raises to fund government services, whether a little revenue or a lot of revenue, we want to help states do it in a way that doesn't negative, negatively impact the state's economic growth and potential. Um, and so we really look for ways to help minimize economic harm caused by taxes. And so my focus today really is going to be on Georgia's tax structure and how Georgia compares to other states. And for the sake of time, I really do want to focus mostly on income and sales taxes today. So starting with a basic overview of Georgia's tax structure, Georgia is not a high tax state. And so that really is something you have going for you. When you look at state and local tax collections combined, you get only about $4,125 in tax collections per capita. And that's actually the ninth lowest state and local tax collections per capita in the nation. And when you look at the sources of revenue, state and local combined, the property tax is the largest source, bringing in about 31% of this revenue for the state and local governments followed by the individual income tax at about 20%, then the sales tax at about 24%. And so we have a bunch of these and other tax rates and collections statistics in our facts and figures book, which you can find on our website. If you wanna look in at a deeper, deeper dive of how the state compares and ranks compared to other states on specific taxes. But overall, Georgia is doing very well when it comes to collections. But just as important as how much the state brings in, if not more important, is how it brings in that revenue. And so this is where we at the Tax Foundation really like to specialize in comparing states according to their tax structure. And you may be familiar with our State Business Tax Climate Index. It's a report we publish every year and have published for the past um, almost two decades now that compares states according to their tax structure. Um, and basically what it does is it uses over 120 different policy variables and it gives states a score based on how pro-growth, transparent, neutral, simple, and stable their tax provisions are. are. So things like, does the state um, inflation index its brackets? Is there a marriage penalty in the brackets? Does the state have a harmful estate tax or alternative minimum tax? How does it treat net, net operating losses and business interest expenses, things like that. And so we look at a ton of different major things that states by and large across the board tend to do. And then we 
rank states on each of the major taxes, corporate and individual income taxes, sales taxes, property and unemployment insurance. And you can see on the screen, Georgia ranks 31st overall on tax structure. And so that is slightly below average. Um, the areas where it's least competitive right now are on individual income taxes, unemployment insurance taxes and sales taxes. However, Georgia is about average on property taxes and very um, performs really well on corporate income taxes with the seventh best structured corporate income tax in the nation right now. And so these are just um, kind of an overview of how each of the major provisions are structured. And then when you look at where Georgia sits, where you look at um, you know, tax structure generally, Georgia is in a highly competitive region, as you all are very well aware, with neighboring Florida and Tennessee, both having the advantage of not having an individual income tax, and North Carolina also, as Chris mentioned, continuing to make really good reforms over the past decade and is still in the process of making further reforms and has now the 10th best, best structured tax code in the nation. So really Georgia is in a highly competitive environment right now. Um, where the state does have an advantage though is over states like Alabama and South Carolina, Arkansas and Louisiana. And one of the reasons those states perform so poorly is because they have a lot of complexity, a lot of outdated provisions that really hurt their competitiveness. A really important thing to keep in mind, though, is that the tax environment is really growing a lot more competitive right now. This year alone, we saw a total of 15 states either enact or implement individual and or corporate income tax cuts. And that's the most we've seen for a very long time, at least two decades, probably more. Um, but in addition to the tax, the states you see on the screen, um, Florida saw a triggered reduction in its corporate income tax rate. Um, Colorado saw a triggered reduction in its corporate and individual income tax rates. Arkansas and Indiana are both continuing to phase in reforms. And so those are the states that newly implemented things this year, in addition to the ones on the screen that newly enacted ones this year. So really, states are doing this for a number of reasons. One is just the fact that states have a lot more revenue on hand than they initially anticipated. Um, going into the pandemic, none of us expected we'd be in this position where, first of all, states received a lot of federal aid from the government that they are able to deploy for various purposes and kind of offset expenses, uh, replenish their unemployment trust funds, things like that. But even of their own accord, states by and large saw growth, continued growth in their general fund revenues across all the major taxes, income and sales taxes especially. And so states are doing just fine coming out of this pandemic and we are seeing states really try to make a name for themselves and gain more competitiveness, especially in this new era of increased remote work flexibility. A lot of states are realizing that people have the flexibility to perhaps work for an employer in one state maybe a high tax, high cost of living state, but live somewhere else. And more and more people are doing that. So that's just something to keep in mind as Georgia considers any possible additional changes to its own tax code. Now quickly, I wanna go through the corporate income tax and then the individual income tax and sales tax and just show you a little bit more about how Georgia compares to other states. As I mentioned before, Georgia has the seventh best structured corporate income tax and that's driven by several different factors, one being the relatively modest corporate rate of 5.75%. That's actually the 12th lowest in the country, or it was as of January 2021. Um, that's probably changed slightly or will change by 2022 as uh, these states who, who have enacted cuts are seeing those implemented. But overall, the rate is competitive and the collections per capita are significantly below the national average. And that's a competitive advantage the state should continue looking to take advantage of and maintain. Um, from a structural standpoint, the state does treat things like business net operating losses and interest expenses in a competitive manner. Georgia doesn't tax foreign income or the new category of income guilty or global intangible low tax income that a lot of states are unfortunately trying to tax. Uh, Georgia also uses single sales factor apportionment, 
So it's taxing corporations based on their sales into Georgia, but not based on their facilities or their employees in Georgia. And so it's not directly taxing that investment in Georgia as much as some other corporate income taxes are. So Georgia is doing well on this front, but it is really important to keep in mind that the corporate income tax, despite being remitted by C corporations, most of the burden is borne by workers in the form of lower wages, shareholders in the form of lower returns, and customers in the form of higher prices. And so it is a tax to continue working to keep as moderate as possible. Another thing to keep in mind is that the corporate income tax is the most volatile of all the major sources of state tax revenue. It fluctuates greatly from year to year. So it's not a dependable source of revenue. And it's something that a lot of states do rely a little less heavily on for that very reason. On the individual income tax front, uh, the individual income tax is Georgia's largest source of state tax revenue. It brings in about 50% of state only tax revenue whereas the sales tax brings in only about 25%. And so it is currently a very major source of revenue for the state. And compared to the average state, Georgia does over rely on income taxes and under rely on sales taxes. And so right now, the average state gets only about 38% of its state tax revenue from individual income taxes. But despite heavier reliance on income taxes, Georgia's collections per capita are slightly lower than the national average, but again, Georgia is currently is sandwiched between Tennessee and Florida, um, and also right there by North Carolina. So dealing with a lot of no income tax states or low income tax states nearby that make it all the more reason that Georgia should really continue working to keep that rate as low as possible. A couple things on the structure I want to point out are just the fact that Georgia's tax code has six brackets. Um, so it is a graduated rate structure, but the structure hasn't changed much at all since 1937. And you can see right off the bat just how outdated that is because that top bracket, the top rate only kicks in at $7,000 in marginal income for single filers. 10,000 for married couples. There's only actually one state whose top rate kicks in at a lower income threshold. And this is good because even though it's technically a graduated rate tax, it functions much like a flat tax, but it would be even more neutral and more competitive, more simple if Georgia were to consolidate those brackets and just have one single rate. Um, that would also take care of the marriage penalty that currently exists in the brackets, where the bracket widths aren't doubled for married couples what they are for single filers, which creates some complexity and can also increase the, the effective rate on married couples compared to two individuals filing as single individuals making the same amount of combined income. So it's just not a neutral provision in the tax code. And then finally, those brackets are not indexed for inflation, which is why that top rate or top bracket is still $7,000. That used to be a lot of money, but right now it's only a fraction of the median household income in Georgia. And so really the vast majority of income earned in Georgia is being taxed at that top 5.75% rate. And it would make a lot of sense to work toward moving toward a flatter structure. Another thing about the standard deduction and personal exemption, uh, I know the legislature did increase the standard deduction this year, and so that's generally a positive thing, you know, making sure individuals uh, are getting that tax relief, but those provisions are still not indexed for inflation either, and so they have lost a lot of their value over time, and that will continue as long as they aren't indexed and aren't raised regularly. And then there is a slight marriage penalty in the standard deduction and a marriage bonus in the personal exemption, where ideally the deduction and exemption should be exactly double for married filers what they are for single individuals. So these are just some structural things that hurt the state's competitiveness. They hurt the state's index ranking. They're not um, super dramatic changes, but they are things that would make the tax structure a bit more competitive. A quick comment also on that top rate of 5.75%. It is kind of around average compared to most states. So it's, I believe, as of 2021, was 
among the states that have a broad-based tax on wage income, there are 41 states that have that. 16 states had a lower top marginal rate than Georgia. So Georgia's rate isn't low, um, but it's not one of the highest either. So it is something that the state should continue to target for reductions. Um, and one thing that could help make this possible is relying more on sales taxes, because as I mentioned earlier, Georgia does under rely on sales taxes. Um, when you look at the sales tax base or the uh, the basket of goods and services the sales tax applies to, it's much narrower in Georgia than it is in the average state. The U.S. average sales tax breadth is 40 percent, whereas in Georgia it's only 31 percent. And what I mean by sales tax breadth is the total value of all consumption in Georgia that is subject to the sales tax as a share of total personal income in Georgia. So right now it's only about 31%. Ideally, it wouldn't quite get to 100% because we don't consume all of the income we earn in a given year. We save some, we invest some, but ideally that breadth should be closer to 70, 60 or 70% in order to fully capture personal consumption in the US um, sales tax bases currently in many states don't yet apply to most consumer services, but newly applying it to more consumer services would make the code more neutral. And that would also generate revenue that could be used to bring down income tax rates and sales tax rates if that is um, something the state wants to look into. Now the rate itself is actually fairly high overall. Um, so you have the 19th highest rate sales tax rate when state and local sales taxes are combined, but the state rate itself is fairly low while the local rate is high. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, meanwhile, sales tax collections per capita are significantly lower than the national average. You're only bringing in about $930 in sales tax collections per capita compared to the national average of about 1,258. And so you are still generating less from the sales taxes than the average state, despite having a relatively high rate. And now if you look quickly at the share of total US personal consumption, you'll see just how much sales, the sales tax used to apply to goods and services pretty evenly. It was about a 50-50 split. Today, services are about 70% of total US personal consumption while goods are only about 30%, but the sales tax base hasn't changed much since it was adopted. So that base has eroded over time and rates have really had to increase, not just in Georgia, but everywhere in order to kind of keep bringing in that same amount of revenue um, without seeing revenue loss over time. So these are just some of the things that are hurting Georgia structurally in terms of its tax structure on our index in terms of the state's tax competitiveness. There are opportunities for reform that the state could look into. Um, and one of the biggest reasons for this right now would be to continue to make the state more competitive. We really see that low and no income tax states have consistent uh, have a consistent benefit in terms of net immigration over the past decade, the states without and income tax have seen much greater in, in migration, about twice the national rate compared to states that do have an individual income tax. We're also seeing states have a lot faster GDP growth if they don't have an individual income tax than if they do. Now in Georgia, um, as I mentioned before, this individual income tax generates half of the state's income tax or half of the state's state tax revenue. So it is something that is currently a very heavily relied upon revenue source, but it would make sense to look for ways to try to rebalance the structure of the tax code toward somewhat more pro-growth, um, less economic, economically harmful taxes and away from some of those more, more harmful taxes. So I can talk about this more at length in the Q&A, but want to just leave you with that for now and look forward to answering questions in a few minutes. Thank you for that, Catherine. Yeah, Catherine will be staying with us uh, throughout the duration of today's call. And so definitely appreciate her um, 
kind of setting the table for where Georgia is at, um, both regionally and nationally. And uh, before I, I turn it over to William, I, I will say I'd mentioned earlier that uh, the Georgia Public Policy Foundation had partnered with the Beacon Hill Institute to produce a series of economic models around the uh, Georgia State Tax Code, what it would look like if you both lowered and flattened the, uh, the top rate here in the state of Georgia. And, and really the, the emphasis behind that were, were a couple of things. And one of those being the, um, the 2010 uh, Special Counsel for, for Georgia State Tax Reform and Fairness. I know I'm probably butchering that, but the, the council that went in and re reviewed and revised the tax code um, along with the work of the state legislature in 2018, in which they lowered the state's top tax rate from 6% to 5.7%. Uh, the House had passed a bill to further lower it to 5.375, but COVID suspended the session that year and, and no further actions were taken. And so um, with that, I just wanted to provide that context and, and turn it over to William to speak a little bit about the report. And, and as I mentioned earlier, for those that, that joined us late today, uh, everyone that's on the call today will receive a, a copy once the report is actually published. It should be here in a few days. And so uh, with that teaser, I'm going to turn it over and um, give William the screen. Let me just share the presentation. Can everyone see that? Great. Um, thanks, Chris. Uh, and I just want to thank the Georgia Public Policy Foundation for partnering with the Beacon Hill Institute on this study. Um, a special thanks to Kyle and Chris for working with us and in inviting me here today to present our findings to everyone. Um, again, my name is William Burke. I am the Director of Research of the Beacon Hill Institute. Um, BHI was founded in 1991, and since we have provided economic analyses for various states around the country. Um, I just want to give you an overview of the study, a uh, quick introduction, a brief overview of House Bill 949, um, our, an overview of our stamp model and the Georgia stamp model. Um, our findings on the fiscal and economic effects of models one through three, and the, um, our findings on the fiscal and economic effects of various revenue offsets that we evaluated, and then um, the fiscal and employment impacts of broadening the sales tax base in Georgia to include services that are currently exempt under the sales tax system, and then just a, a brief conclusion. Okay, so um, kind of just reiterating what Catherine shared with you all, um, but Georgia is among 32 states that currently impose a graduated income tax system. Um, the income tax in Georgia ranges from 1% to 1.75%. And again, the more majority of taxpayers in Georgia are subject to the 5.75% top rate, um, any income earner over $7,000 for a single taxpayer and $10,000 for married taxpayers. So a brief overview of um, House Bill 949, which is basically, it served as our basis for modeling a reduction in the top income tax rate and the further elimination of all income tax brackets in Georgia. House Bill 949 would reduce the top income tax rate in Georgia from 5.75% to 5.375% while, again, removing all marginal income tax brackets. While the bill provides for the basis for our models, we didn't um, model the bill itself exactly one for one. So what we do is we have a stamp model, which we apply to tax changes in various states. Um, our stamp model stands for the State Tax Analysis Modeling Program. Um, we have created stamp and deployed it in over 26 states. Um, so what stamp is, is a five-year dynamic CGE model, uh, CGE standing for Computable General Equilibrium Model. Um, we have also created a LAMP model for various cities and localities around the country, um, LAMP being our local analysis modeling program. 
The purpose of STAMP is to determine the fiscal and economic effects of state tax law changes. The model provides key economic variables for both a baseline scenario and a tax change scenario. One of the principal purposes of the STAMP model is to estimate the dynamic revenue effects from tax law changes, which take into account the positive and or negative economic um, effects of a tax law change. So we use our Georgia STAMP model um, in this case to evaluate the effects to the state economy of reducing the top income tax rate uh, while creating a flat tax system in Georgia. We also evaluate various potential revenue offsets. Um, the Georgia stamp model allows us to input into fields, um, changes in the state personal and corporate income tax rates, the state sales tax rate, uh, various state sales tax exemptions and um, other local and state taxes. The model estimate change, estimates changes in uh, state and local tax revenues, state real gross domestic product, state employment, state investment, um, and state real disposable income. In our analysis, we model the fiscal and economic effects of various um, tax law changes starting in 2023, and we run that through 2027. So model one in our study, um, we reduced the top income tax rate from its current 5.75% rate down to 5% while eliminating all marginal income tax brackets. To offset the revenue loss, we brought in the sales tax base to include construction services. It currently exempt under the sales tax system. Um, and I'm just gonna overview a few of the key economic indicators here. So for, in, for employment, we estimate that, um, sorry, this blocking here. Um, We estimate that net employment would fall by 21,134 in 2023. Um, we estimate that real disposable income, or sorry, not fall, increase by 21,134. We estimate that real disposable income would increase by 2.104 billion um, in 2023. And that st state real gross domestic product would increase by 1.021 billion in 2023. Um, for the fiscal effects, we estimate that the personal income tax would fall by $1.840 um, billion. Total state change would be 130 or would be 138.50 um, million as a result of increasing the sales and use tax with um, construction services. In total, uh, we estimate that state and total state and local tax change will be 187 million point five nine. Okay, um, model two, which we reduced the top income tax rate from 5.75 percent to 4 percent. Um, again, we eliminate all marginal income tax brackets. To offset the loss in revenue, we brought in the sales tax base to include construction services and professional scientific and technical services that are currently exempt under the Georgia sales tax system. Um, in 2023, we estimate that net employment would increase by 32,527 jobs. Real disposable income would increase by $4.622 billion in 2023 and state real GDP would increase by 1.787 billion in 2023. We estimate that personal income taxes would fall by uh, $4.424 billion. And then that would be offset again by increasing the sales and use tax base by $4.453 billion. Um, total state and local tax change would be $141 uh, million. For model three, we reduced the top income tax rate from 5.75% down to 3%. And then we're also creating that into a flat tax by eliminating the marginal income tax brackets. Um, to offset the loss in revenue, we brought in the sales tax base to include 
all currently exempt services um, under the sales tax system in Georgia. In 2023, we predict that net employment would increase by 43,000 jobs. Um, real disposable income would increase by $6.545 billion. And state real GDP would increase by nearly $2 billion. Um, personal income tax revenues would fall by $6.689 billion. Um, sales and use taxes would increase by $6.602 billion. And in total, um, with state and local tax changes, revenues would increase by $77 million. Um, moving on to some of the various um, revenue offsets that we evaluated in the study. Um, the first one being the fiscal and economic effects of capping the film tax credit. So um, here we are setting caps for the film tax credit starting at 400 million in 2023, 300 million in 2024, 200 million in 2025, 100 million in 2026. And then we eliminate the tax credit entirely in the last year. Um, and just for the first year, uh, we are predicting that net employment would fall by 312 jobs. Obviously, there's not, you know, a huge amount of jobs in the film industry um, in Georgia. So it's not going to have a giant effect in total of employment. Um, real disposable income would fall by 19 million and state real GDP, 109 million. Um, so overall, we're predicting that personal income tax um, personal income tax revenues would fall by 140 million in 2023 and by um, 80 million in 2023 for corporate income taxes. Um, when you combine the total effects, it would total state and local tax changes would be 207 million in 2023. Um, the fiscal and economic effects of increasing the sales tax rate by 1%. So here we're literally just increasing the current Georgia sales tax rate from four to 5%. Um, in 2023, we estimate that net employment would increase by over 8,000 jobs. Real disposable income would increase by 1.387 billion um, and real state GDP would increase by 400 or would decrease, my mistake, by 485 million. And real disposable income would fall, not increase. Um, personal income taxes would fall by 40 million. Uh, corporate income taxes would fall by 6.32 million. And state and use taxes, sales and use taxes would increase by uh, over $1.6 billion, respectively. Um, total local and state change would increase by $1.532 billion. So here we're overviewing the fiscal impacts of broadening the sales tax base with services. Um, these are the services that we use in models one through three in this study. Um, you can see here there's services that are exempt, such as construction, motor vehicle and parts dealers, investment in financial advisors, um, real estate services, professional scientific and technical administrative and support, waste management and remediation, promoters, agents, and managers in repair and maintenance and personal and laundry services. Again, these are all exempt under the current sales tax base in Georgia. Um, so here we are estimating the fiscal impacts of them. Um, and in total, total state and local changes would be 6.293 billion in 2023. Um, and again, for model one, we're using construction services. You can see their fiscal impacts at the top there. Um, in model two, we're combining construction services and professional, scientific, and technical kind of in the middle row there. Um, and then for model three, we're using all of these to offset the revenue loss from uh, uh, decreasing the state top income tax into a flat tax from 5.75 to 3% in model three. Um, the employment impact of these same services of including them in the sales tax base. Uh, um, and 
as you can see, it kind of varies for each industry based on their total employment as it stands now. Um, you're going to see that the construction industry in that in the professional scientific and technical industries have the most jobs and are going to have the most significant economic impacts as a result. However, reducing them um, is fairly small in comparison to the benefits of decreasing the personal income tax we find in Georgia. So in total, if we include all of these sales tax exemptions in the current sales tax base, we estimate in 2023, that total employment loss would be 9,589 as a result. Um, and kind of to conclude everything, so, and I, I, I wanna reiterate what Catherine said earlier, in general, um, Georgia's income tax system is already designed similarly to a flat tax. Uh, taxpayers who earn over 7,000, single taxpayers that is, are already subject to the top income tax rate. Uh, we estimate that the number of filers that, um, that are subject to the top income tax rate comprise 85% of all tax returns um, as it currently stands. Um, in general, income taxes penalize savings. They hurt uh, incentives for people to work. Thus, they end up hurting investment and in turn employment and state economic growth, reducing the top income tax rate in, in Georgia and creating a flat tax system will help reduce some of these consequential effects and help remove the uh, compliance burden of the current tax system. Um, Reducing the top income tax rate into a flat tax will also improve the state economy pretty significantly, we find. Um, it will improve state economic competitiveness and will attract people and businesses to the state. The stamp model estimates that all leading economic indicators, state real GDP, employment, investment, and real disposable income will increase significantly under the tax change. Um, while reducing the state's top income tax rate and eliminating marginal income tax brackets will come at a revenue cost, our analysis shows that several revenue offsets through broadening the sales tax base and increasing the sales tax rate or partially removing the, fil the film tax credit would come at a little economic consequence relative to the benefits of reducing the top income tax rate. Finally, while creating a flat tax could be regressive for lower income tax groups. BHI suggests that creating an income tax credit would offset any regressivity of the tax. Um, you could theoretically increase the personal exemption or the standard deduction, and it would have similar effects, but it would come at a larger revenue cost. Um, an income tax credit could better target lower income groups and would probably end up if designed correctly, come at a lower revenue cost. Um, and again, I'd be happy to answer any questions afterwards. Um, thanks guys. Yeah, thank you for that, William. And uh, before we uh, segue to our uh, two chairmen that have joined us here today for, for some of their remarks on the likelihood of uh, activity around the tax code in the upcoming session, um, you know, I, I just wanna reiterate both the, the slides and the report and the, and the data that William provided, the intent of that is to provide a, a menu of options uh, for policymakers to consider, both in terms of the uh, revenue side and, and the offsets. And so, um, you know, with, with the spirit of that, um, I, will, uh, I will turn it over uh, first to um, Chairman Chuck, Chuck Huffstetler, uh, just, if you'd like to provide some some remarks on on what the uh, the fine folks of Georgia can expect here uh, in the Senate Finance Committee uh, in the upcoming session. All right. Well, thank you for having me on here. Um, I'm actually on two feet here. My government computer is giving me some problems, but Zoom was down at the Capitol for several hours yesterday, Capitol wide. So uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, we uh, I, and I appreciate this report. I mean, it excites me to see this kind of thing. And I was glad to see you acknowledge that if we do a flat tax, you've got to do something. We could do a flat tax right now and, and actually bring in the same amount of revenue, but some people at the lower end would get hit with higher taxes and it's really a tax shift, not a tax cut. So when you talked about doing it with an income tax credit or 
personal exemption, something like that. And I think that's what we need to do. Um, and again, on our sales tax, you know, we, we have a number, I think it was 30 once in the country, not great on the rate, but on the actual collections, um, dollar collections were ninth in the country, which is great. The problem with that again is that it's just not broad enough. We did broaden it out um, with Marketplace Facilitator. We were treating vendors in uh, California and China and places like that better than our own businesses here in the state by giving them a lower rate. And actually they owed the tax. There just wasn't an efficient means to collect it. And so a Supreme Court decision allowed that to go forward. And um, it's been about uh, three quarters of a billion dollars that's coming in through that much higher than some of the estimates uh, would would have thought. So um, we do need to broaden it out. I, I know I'd looked at some numbers uh, a couple of years ago and per capita, Florida was bringing in the same dollars slightly more than us per capita, but the way they were structured, they obviously cannot have an income tax. We give uh, about nine and a half billion in uh, tax credits and sales tax exemptions, various things. I know you had 12.2, but you throw the corporate in there, I believe it's about 14 billion total in income taxes. So if you, if you took away everything, and I'm not suggesting that, but if you took away everything at nine and a half billion and the 14 billion, you could obviously have a much, much lower tax rate, income tax rate in the state of Georgia. And then further, as you talked about uh, broadening it out to other uh, areas such as services, um, we could have a, a, a structure that, you know, many of us believe the, the sales tax is a much fairer tax. Everybody's paying it and uh, could see some some great benefit of that. Um, <clears throat> the good thing about the state right now is our, our finances are in great shape. Uh, we were very concerned with COVID and, and we're preparing for the worst. And uh, even if you don't count the federal money that we've got extra to spend, and but at the same time acknowledging that some of that federal money that went to others did stimulate a, a sugar high in the economy, which uh, my caveat is that scares the heck out of me if interest rates go up, how the federal government's gonna pay that interest now they'll start cutting money to the state. But we're, we have increased from, I think it was one day's fund balance back in 2009. We've increased every year except one, our fund balance. Now we're actually at our statutory maximum of $4.288 billion as of the end of last uh, fiscal year. Um, our lottery reserves are in great shape. Our uh, Tobacco settlement reserves 100 million. Our uh, teachers retirement system that had been in the 70s is now at about 92% funded, way better than just about any any other state out there. So financially, we're in great shape. There's a little concern with COVID, what's gonna happen. And I know there's some concern of with the federal sugar money out there going away, what's gonna happen You know, when the, when the money's gone, but the bills are still there to pay. So we've got to, to follow that. But, um, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I do hope we can move toward a much broader uh, sales tax. As you mentioned, look at some of these exemptions. We've got a process in place now to where uh, Chairman Blackman and myself can look at five of these each year and, and say, do they make sense? Are they making us money, losing us money? And, and try to go forward and, and perhaps shed some light on those because we've been in the third tier of states, you know, when judged by others that just really don't do a good job of evaluating those. They're just sort of out there for forever in some cases. So great report, it excites me. Um, I would love to see us move in this direction. We've got uh, uh, good financial times in Georgia, thanks to uh, uh, good business. You know, you mentioned the, the corporate environment. It is awesome in Georgia. And that's why we're the number one state to do business. Uh, but there's uh, lots of other opportunities. I was a Senate sponsor of the uh, income tax rate cut. We went from six to 5.75. That's the only rate cut we've had since 1937 when the tax uh, went in. And I'd sure like to have one more before I get out of here. Yeah, thank you for those remarks. Appreciate that, uh, Chairman Huffstetler and uh, Chairman Blackman, are there any uh, any kind of general thoughts you'd like to share with us today, and just you know, kind of expand? <clears throat> well, that you know, uh, Chairman Huffstedler is quite eloquent and uh, did not leave a whole lot of meat left on that bone, there, Chairman. I, I'm not sure I can add a whole lot to what you had to say. It um, pretty comprehensive. I, 
I, you know, would echo some of the comments, Chris, uh, uh, you know, um, but before I do, I do want to thank you and, and William and Catherine and, and Kyle for, for putting this on and, and giving, uh, you know, us the opportunity to weigh in. I'm relatively new at this. I've, I've you know, been chairing Ways and Means for just a few months now. So learning a little bit from uh, my, my, you know, partner across the, the hall there, uh, Chairman Upstedler and um, Chairman uh, Harrell um, as well, still around. Um, I, you know, I think he's he's certainly uh, been on speed dial for the last few months. So, uh, you know, going back and starting, uh, you know, we were, we, we have cut taxes twice in, in so many years um, here. And uh, another proposal a year and a half ago, um, as mentioned before, that would flatten uh, the rate was was put forward um, by the House and uh, of course COVID hit and you know that was um, an uncertain uh, amount of, uh, of uncertainty that hit us and so we, uh, we we tried to to get navigate through that but we have been extremely fortunate thanks to Chairman Huffstetler, Chairman Harrell who did pass Marketplace Facilitator that's that's helped uh, regarding collections for our state and our local governments um, I, you know, I think the uh, tax cut we implemented earlier this year was also good for our working families. So we've seen that um, and uh, very interested and intrigued by a lot of the numbers that you put forward. Uh, we like tax cuts, uh, but as you mentioned, also, we have a very broad tax base um, as it is and uh, a lot of things to consider. I would note uh, a couple of things, I think, as as Chairman Huffstedler mentioned, uh, the, the nearly $10 billion dollars um, that that we have in in some exemptions and credits, um, as much or more than half of that is is in you know our energy exemption and um, you know what we do for our our seniors on the income side and then uh, pharmaceutical and uh, food uh, sales tax. So a large portion of that um, is in just a handful of those. So um, obviously y'all have have considered a lot. Uh, appreciate the data and the information and um, you know we want to do what's best for our citizens and um, I think we've got you know good working relationship and a good team that will continue to evaluate these things in a in a very thorough and deliberate way and and try to try to make sure we we do that very thing so thank you and thank you uh, Chair Blackman for those remarks as well and uh, just want to emphasize again how much we appreciate you and Chairman Huffstetler taking time out from the uh, redistricting, redistricting special session to uh, to join us today. Um, with that, we have a few minutes left before our uh, stop at 1 p.m. I, I did receive, um, I want to uh, tell everyone, please send in your questions because we do have a few minutes left for those. Um, in, in the interim, we had received a comment here and, and I want to pose it to William and um, the, the comment was that, that local tax effects and thus economic impacts ignore windfall gains from expansion of the sales tax base. A workable statutory mechanism for neutralizing those gains remains to be found. And so I wanted to um, put that forth to you, William, and, and just see if, if y'all had taken that into account uh, when you were uh, compiling this report and writing those numbers. Yeah, so our model does in fact take into account um, both the local tax effects and also the economic impacts, of course, of, um, of broadening the sales tax base. And you'll see more, the study shows more in depth, um, these simulations, and it separates it out from the models that we've run, which models one through three do include um, broadening the sales tax base with services. But so I, I think that should answer your question. It, the model takes into account the adverse effects on um, various revenue sources from broadening the sales tax base. Um, and it also takes into account the negative economic impacts of broadening the sales tax base, which they're small relative, again, to the gains that are created under um, a reduction of the top income tax rate. So. I hope that answers your comment. Um, I, I, I thought it was a little unclear, but I, again, hope that answers um, or clarifies your concern. Yeah, we'll monitor that here over the next few minutes okay. to see if there's any follow-up, but, uh, but thank you for answering that. And so 
We just received a question. Um, where do the panelists stand on our manufacturing tax credits in Georgia generally? And I'll, uh, I tell you what, I'll start off with you, uh, Chairman Huffsteller, uh, for that one. All right, and I, I should have added to you talked about the vote. We're having the vote any minute now on the Senate map on the floors. Okay. Late, so I should have told you I might get up and run off to do that. But um, the, the manufacturing tax credit, I, I think, uh, you know, there's various ones. I think there's some good tax credits out there. Uh, some of them may or may not be good, but the thing that we've tried to do is not put our opinion in there. Sometimes my opinion is not what is fact. And so that's why we we want to study these um, five each year from, from each of us over a period of a few years and, and, you know, with some outside experts outside of us and say, what do you guys think about these? Is it is it positive? Is it negative? Should we do more of it, less of it? And so that's what we propose going forward. The other thing that we've tried to do, I know since I've been finance chair, and there's been one or two minor exceptions, but we try to set these where they don't go on forever, that they last for five years, and that gives heartburn to some people. And it's not to eliminate them, but to say, we need to look at these every five years and say, what happened? Did it make sense? We, we realized in three years we couldn't get enough data to really make a good decision and four was pushy so five years is a reasonable amount of time to look at the effect of it what it's done on our state and that's what my my preference is is to to continue to to study these and and let people do economic analysis on them and tell us what that is not my personal opinion per se Absolutely, and, uh, and Chairman Blackman, any, any additional thoughts on, on that question regarding manufacturing tax credits? Well, I, I'm probably gonna say the same thing in a little different way, but you know, um, it's, it's a very analytical process, um, you know, uh, right here at lunch. I'm glad we went just before lunch instead of just after tax policy uh, puts a lot of people to sleep. But, I, you know, I think the, um, the fact that we're extremely deliberate when uh, a proposal comes before our committee and we look at the kinds of jobs and what kind of impact it's going to have on the economy and 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 the proposal is done in such a way that you know other states are referenced and we look at what's happened elsewhere just as much as you did today um, on, on certain things and i think that uh, the review that comes forward every you know, a few years when you have sunsets regarding some of these programs, it, it gives us an opportunity to check and make sure that what was uh, what was said would happen, happened, and then we have the opportunity to review that um, here and over uh, at Chairman Huffstedler, as he mentioned, over, over in the Senate as well. So, um, you know, we, we want to continue to be the, the number one state in which to do business, uh, if at all possible. That's a, a pretty, pretty strong record of eight years in a row and and uh, the jobs um, the unemployment rate that we have going now coming you know as we you know uh, have you know hopefully emerged somewhat from from the COVID environment and the way our states uh, weathered the storm has uh, has been pretty uh, I think indicative of our approach and uh, the, you know the governor's approach and and what we're able to do um, on the economic front. All right, so I'm looking here at the time and want to be respectful of, of everyone uh, spending their lunch hour with us today. I'm going to pose one last question to Catherine. Uh, I don't want to put her on the spot too much, but just, you know, after seeing uh, the numbers that William presented and the various models, um, just any any thoughts in general regarding how adopting one or you know, one of those models would, would help Georgia in terms of the competitiveness ranking? Absolutely. Well, the models clearly showed that adopting these types of reforms would be really good for the state in terms of job growth and wage growth, in terms of overall economic growth. Um, one thing I would just point out is that it is really important in expanding the sales tax base to try to not capture business inputs, since that leads to a lot of tax pyramiding. Um, the sales tax really should be a retail sales tax on just final consumption. So a lot of states have been tempted by the revenue of taxing business inputs, but most of those do get uh, passed along. Those taxes get passed along to consumers anyway. So we want to make sure it's transparent and that those taxes are only applying on the final 
you know, product or service that consumers are purchasing, but there's significant room for broadening the base to consumer goods and services. And like William showed, that would really generate a lot of economic growth and be excellent news for the state. So it's definitely something that is worth considering. Great. I, I think that's an excellent uh, question to end on. I would like to thank all four of our panelists for joining us today. Um, I'd like to thank those of you who attended our, our panel and, like I said, spent the lunch hour with us today um, going over the tax code here in the state of Georgia. And so um, with that, I will um, turn the floor back over to our president and CEO, Kyle Winfield. All right, well, thanks, Chris, and thanks to each of our panelists. Y'all did a fantastic job here uh, going through what, as Chairman Blackman noted, can, can, be a, can be a very technical sort of subject, but I think when the, the interaction that people have with their money and their government uh, comes into the discussion, it can be very, very interesting for a lot of us, and um, we're, we're proud to be uh, residents of a low tax state. We want to see it be a very uh, competitive state as well. We've done a lot uh, policy-wise in Georgia to, to put ourselves in that position. Uh, this is one more area that we want to keep in mind uh, because we know this is the best state in the country and we just want it to uh, that to be reflected in, in every aspect that we can. And uh, so we, we thank uh, Catherine and William for, for your thoughts about how Georgia can do that. Uh, Chairman Huffstetler, Chairman Blackman for uh, for engaging with us and, and opening up a little bit about, you know, possibly where we could see the legislature go or, or what the what the interest may be. And we're very much looking forward to uh, to seeing what may come about in January. I, I thought we might have some breaking news there with Senator Huffstetler rushing off to vote for the uh, for the map, but I guess that'll have to wait until after we adjourn. Um, so uh, you, you'll have to tune in Friday. Uh, or come on Friday to our event. It'll be at the Renaissance Way Really Hotel next to the Cobb Galleria. Registration starts at 8.30. Uh, the program will start at nine. It will run through lunchtime. And we hope that everyone who joined us today uh, can join us for that as well. So thank you once more. Thank you once again to our sponsors. And with that, we will uh, have this first session of the 2021 Georgia Legislative Policy Forum. Adjourn. Thank you very much. Thank you.